And we are live. Uh, thank you guys for coming once again. Got to get myself into my YouTube voice. I've noticed recently that I actually do have a different voice. Like, there's a different voice between Telltale just chilling with family or something and Telltale the YouTuber. I don't know. It's just weird. Um, I went to the Secular Student Alliance uh, conference fairly recently. That was um, a <clears throat> couple of weeks ago. And I got to meet um, a guy named Bart Campolo. I'd never heard of this guy before, but he's got a podcast called Humanize Me. And it's really, really interesting. So his whole bit is he thinks that... Um, so his his father is like a an extremist pastor kind of thing, right? And he was raised that way. But apparently when Bart left... Uh, religion. His father, of course, took it hard, but strengthened their relationship together. And I was very impressed by that. Like, that is an exception to the rule. That almost never happens. But uh, he's kind of made it his mission in life, Bart has, as a secular humanist or an atheist. He's made it his mission in life to focus on the secular community more than on the Christian community. He's worried about improving our behavior as atheists and things like that, improving our communication techniques, so on and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, uh, I go to this guy's talk, Bart Campolo. I went to his talk there on uh, at the conference and I was really impressed. Like, he is a really good speaker. But I talked to him afterwards, and it was completely different. It was like complete night and day difference between how he talks to a crowd and how he talks to a normal person. And I thought that was really interesting. Like, he puts on not like a, not like a facade or a, a fake image necessarily but he puts on this stage voice that draws people in gets them interested keeps them interested i mean he was a pastor for like a really long time you know so i don't know um i i think what he does is he kind of embellishes his words a little bit like he kind of puts more emphasis on it. it's really hard to describe but anyway he's a really really good speaker and I'd definitely go to another uh, one of his talks. So, Okay, let's get into uh, what I was going to talk about originally. So I did a little bit of searching around the electric internet machine and happened across this nifty little thing. It is every... It, so I found an archive of every secret Mormon handbook from 1899 to present. So uh, that's pretty awesome. I was so happy to find that. So I just kind of wanted to glance through it, see what their, their main issues were, because, of course, they started in, um, well, supposedly Joseph Smith found the, all that stuff, all those tablets and plates or whatever, he found all those in 1823, buried back in his backyard. Um, God, this is a ridiculous story. Anyway, he found them in 1823, and then the, the religion really started to get its roots in around the 1830s, the 1840s. It was really growing. Um, he had like a printing press... Um, Let me just look, for those of you watching the live stream, um, the history of the Latter-day Saint movement. I was hoping to get, like, an exact timeline on this. So the succession crisis of 1844, I think that's when Joseph Smith died, was 1844. Because um, there was a big thing. Like, he never really outlined exactly who was supposed to take over after he died. And he had a son, so naturally you'd think that the son would 
um, would kind of take control of the church, right? Except the kid was like 10. Um, and then there were like presidents of the board that thought they had a right to it. And then there was somebody who produced a signed letter, supposedly signed by Joseph Smith, that said, if I die, then this guy gets it, you know. And nobody was there to authenticate it when it happened or anything. But yeah, it was a big mess. So the succession crisis of 1844, I guess that's probably when he died. But uh, so anyway, point is that by 1899, when this book was produced, um, like everything had already been well established, like the whole church was well established. They had their sets of rules and they'd been governing over a group of people for like a really long time. Right. So what are the primary issues that they felt needed to be addressed in congregations in 1899? Let's find out. Let me see. Oh, of course, they don't have a table of contents because those weren't invented until 2006 or something. Ugh. Okay. All right. So general instructions. Salt Lake City, Utah, December 1st, 1900. To presidents of stakes and bishops in Zion... (laughs) <laughs> the time is now approaching for the settlement of tithing for the year 1900 and for making up the annual reports. We therefore direct the attention of those who have charge of tithing affairs in, this, uh, in the several wards and stakes of Zion to this important subject and issue the following instructions respecting the, um, respecting the receiving and accounting for the tithes. Interesting. Okay, so care of tithes, tithing settlement. So they were always about money since day one, pretty much, is the bottom line here. Um, they're, they're primarily focused on ensuring that they get their money from, uh, you know, from their people. Annual inventory, uh, cash remittances, tithing credit, tithing receipts and vouchers. God, the whole thing is about tithing, really? They didn't have anything else important to say. Nothing. (laughs) Record of tithe payers and non-tithe payers. They keep records of these people. Loans of tithes. You can get loans of tithes. No tithing credit should be given to any persons, uh, whatever, on promises to pay at some future date. Nor should the tithes be loaned or persons be allowed to draw from the tithing storehouse unless they have written authority from the presidency of the church or presiding bishopric. I think that's how you say that word, bishopric. This applies to all officers as well as to other members of the church. So they're saying that they're not loaning out the money that people gave for tithing, I I think. I think that's what they're saying here. Hmm. That's really interesting. Payment of presiding bishop's office orders. How to pay orders, bishop's percentage. See, this is something interesting about, um, like, about timelines, time frames, and years. So, I don't know if you guys have ever heard somebody speak in Latin on TV or something, but they don't speak with a Latin accent. And that's at least in part because we are very limited in what we know about that language because we don't have any recordings of people speaking Latin from two, three, four hundred, five hundred years ago or um, or any other language for that matter. We don't know what the ancient Aztecs sounded like when they spoke that language. We don't know what their accent sounded like or how they pronounced words or things like that. I mean, we have written records of these things, of course, but we don't we don't have the, the audio recordings. So English as we know it today, like American English or British English, sounds completely different from the English that we hear on phonographs. I mean, just their inflections and their, their accents are so different from what we're used to. It's like a caricature. So um, anyway, I don't know. I... I sit here reading this book and I try to imagine it being read in their voice, like the person who was writing it. But I have absolutely no way to do that because we we don't know what they sounded like. It's just amazing to me. 
anyway, so uh, we are six pages into this. What is it? Um, six pages into this 23 page book, and it's so far completely about tithing. Um, bishop's percentage. Okay. How to pay orders. Stake tithing clerk. Stake presidency. Oh my God. Charity account. Disposition of tithes. It, the entire freaking thing is about tithing. Okay. Instructions to bishops. Compiling the annual tithing reports. Okay. I swear that is all these people cared about at the time. Did they really not have anything relevant to say about reasons people can get disfellowshipped or, or anything else? Nothing? Ward balance sheet, ward inventory. I don't know. Maybe this is just... Maybe they had that in a separate book. I don't know. Reports to send to stake tithing clerk. Okay. So that was the 1899 book. Let's just take a quick look. Or Actually, no, that was a 1900 book. Let's take a look at 1905. Hmm. Annual instructions, number seven. Well, there you go. They have, like, a title page at the front. What's the title on this one? Can we read it? Um, Can't read it. It's just too blurred out. Well, this is annual instruction, so presumably this is not supposed to just be about tithing. This is supposed to be about, you know, leading a congregation and things, right? I mean, one would think. Oh, look! Okay, so 1905 is the year they invented the uh, table of contents. Now we know. Now we know. Okay. So we've got... Uh, oh, man, it's so tiny. Let me zoom in on this. Hang on. The Aaronic Priesthood... Agricultural wards, annual church statistics. Okay, that's cool. So it's not all about tithing anymore. And then we have annual ward tithing records, annual tithing accounts, annual tithing settlement, annual stake reports, appointment to bishops. Okay, see, this is what I was expecting, something more like this. Although they did, um, they did devote a disproportionate amount of... Uh, pages to tithing. I think that's funny. <laughs> God, these people. Okay. Uh, you know what? Let's just take a look at annual church statistics. Page 18, I believe it said. 18. Okay. Oh, no, that's... Yeah, okay, here we go. Each bishop will give the names of the members of his ward who have, to his certain knowledge, left the ward without taking recommends. Hmm. And also the names of those who are residing in his ward, claiming to be Latter-day Saints, who have not been received by recommend. This information will enable presidents of stakes, bishops, and others to trace up many persons who have left without recommends. Okay, so I don't know what recommends means in this context, but I do know what recommends are. I know what a temple recommend is. Um, I don't know if it's the same thing in this case or not, but a, a temple recommend is um, basically where you have to get a piece of paper from the like the bishop or the ward president or whatever saying you're allowed to go to the temple. Like you can go to their little chapel, I think it's called. It's basically like a church. You can go to their church. Anybody can go to the church. But to get into the temple, you have to have the temple recommend. <clears throat> And you have to be just absolutely, completely indoctrinated to get your hands on one of those, too. So I don't, you know, I don't know if that applies to this situation or not, but that's that's what it's saying here. Um, others to trace up many persons who have left without recommends. We hope that presidents of stakes and the bishops will interest themselves in this important report so that the statistics of the church will be as accurate as local conditions will permit. Oh, more stuff on tithing. Okay. <laughs> God. The bishopric are common judges in Israel, and it is their duty to make proper inquiry as to whether the tithing paid by each member during the year is a full tithing or not. And in all cases where they have no reasonable doubt to the contrary, it should be recorded as stated by the tithe payer. Okay. So they're saying here that... Um, if somebody has like a hundred thousand dollar car and a five hundred thousand dollar house and they paid like five thousand dollars in tithing, because you're supposed to pay ten percent of your gross income, I think. So before taxes, before health insurance, before anything else, you give ten percent of that amount 
to the church. That's what it is now. I assume it was the same in 1905. Um, so they're saying that if they see something suspicious, like somebody with all this expensive gear, and they're paying five grand a year, they're supposed to start questioning. They won't mark it down. So it says, in all cases where they have no reasonable doubt to the contrary, it should be recorded as stated by the tithe payer. Okay. So they're also partially relying on um, on honesty here. Hang on. So we've got annual tithing accounts. Annual ward tithing record. Oh, God. Okay. Non-tithe payers. Bishop's percentage. Ugh. We were pleased to notice that a number of the wards have eliminated this, uh, it's like, unfavorable feature from their records by converting the non-tithe payers. But there is still a large number, of, there is still a large number of persons, oh my god, grammatical errors in 1905. Fuck these people. Um, claiming to be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who have not been converted to the payment of their tithes and offerings. Huh. We therefore urgently desire presidents of stakes, high counselors, priests, teachers, and presiding officers of the several quorums, it's really hard to read, and organizations of the ward and stake to labor with the non-tithe payers. Mm, interesting. Stake contingent fund. Ward records. Okay, that, that's actually pretty interesting. So why don't we skip forward? Let's say... Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so we've got... Uh, I'm just looking at my files here. I've got General Handbook of Instruction number two. That was the first one we looked at. It was 1900. Then we have General Handbook of Instruction number one. That's 1899. So that's what this one is that I have pulled up here. Um... 1899, wow. Ward inventory, ward record of non-tithe pairs. It's pretty much the same thing as the uh, 1900 one. I imagine they probably have a few changes and corrections here and there, but uh, that's really cool to have, like, this book from 1899, you know? Like, even if it's just complete garbage, uh, it's still cool to have. Okay. Let's take a look at, uh, well, let me think about this. I'm interested in what was happening at major times in history. So we've got like 1944, the height of World War II slash the end of World War II, right? So it's got to have something interesting in it. Let's see. Table of contents again. They invented those in 1905. So the more you know. Handbook of Instruction, Stake Presidency. Hang on, let me just... What? No, okay, are you serious? They really don't have a table of contents here. They don't have a... Ta so they had a table of contents in 1905, and they don't have one in 1944? Come on, people. You're disappointing me even more. This is sad. All right. No table of contents in 1944. Wait, is this the table of contents? To interview and sign recommends a persons recommended by bishops to go to the temple. See, okay, so it's kind of a an ad hoc um, table of contents. Stake auxiliary officers. Stake auxiliary officers and board members are appointed by the stake presidency. Signing letters. Letters of special import addressed to the general authorities should be signed by the president. Yeah, just regular old stuff. <coughs> Stake priesthood leadership meetings, stake priesthood meetings, and priesthood conventions. Hmm. Relation to administrative officers. While under the revelations, patriarchs... I'm sorry. While under the revelations, patriarchs are selected and ordained by members of the Council of the Twelve Apostles. They missed a comma. These people kill me more and more every sentence I read. They act in the stakes of Zion under the direct supervision of the presidency of the stake whose privilege and duty it is to supervise their work and to make adequate provision for it to be carried forward in an orderly way. Huh. Recording blessings. 
all patriarchal blessings, as herein before defined, should be recorded, and one copy of the recorded blessing should be given to the recipient, and one copy should be preserved for the record book. Hmm. It's really interesting stuff. Um, I mean, even if it is kind of dry or just kind of void of information like valuable information it's valuable in its own right to me because for one thing it's old as sin it's from 1944 and the others and it's something that the mormon church doesn't want us to see right it's something that we aren't supposed to be looking at or reading um you know there's something else interesting that i wanted to uh take a look at uh let's see here it was um So we got Scientology secret documents from WikiLeaks. <clears throat> yeah, so Church of Scientology's operating Thetan documents. You can download these from WikiLeaks. This is something else that we aren't supposed to see. We are not supposed to, our eyes are not supposed to uh, look over these documents. And like I said, that's reason enough for me to look, you know. But anyway, I'll do I'll I'll go through those one of these days. I'll go through them on another podcast. But yeah. So that's 1944. Now let's look at uh what do I what's the latest uh Mormon handbook that I have? 1989. Well, I have the latest, but I'm looking in this archive I got. 83, 89. Yeah. It looks like 1989 is the latest, which is the year that I was born, interestingly enough. Oh, this is just a letter. Okay, hang on. I've got... uh, 1976, 1983. Wait a minute. Okay, this is 1983 that I have here. Please tell me they have a table of contents. Is this a table of contents? I, I can't tell what this is. I don't think this is a table of contents. It isn't. This one does not have one. This is from 1983. Come on. Okay. General Church Administration. Area Administration. Executive Administrator. So, uh, a lot like the Jehovah's Witness um, manual, like the uh, Shepherd the Flock manual, the Elder's Handbook, they're just kind of talking about uh, various roles in the church. Executive Administrator. Director for Temporal Affairs. Director for Temporal Affairs. Directors for temporal affairs are assigned in geographical areas outside the United States and Canada, uh, representing the presiding bishopric in administering the temporal affairs of the church. Okay. Now I need to look this up. Director for temporal affairs. Okay. Um, Let's just find out what they're talking about here. What is Director for Temporal Affairs? Uh, that's the Mormon newsroom. Don't want to go there. Uh, these are all Mormon websites. I want to find the anti-Mormon websites. Oh, check this out. Some chick on LinkedIn has Director for Temporal Affairs listed on her resume. <laughs> okay. I wonder if that's landed or any jobs. Okay, let's just take a look at the Mormon newsroom. The new director for temporal affairs for the Pacific area, Terry Oaks, was surprised and excited. Yeah, okay, that's boring. All right, let's switch back to the uh, the manual here. I'm going to have to do some research on that, and then I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i do a video on the director of temporal affairs. That sounds just full of information that I want to talk about. Districts and stakes, special units, student wards, singles wards. Singles wards, interesting. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, God, they have a long name, are members of geographically designated wards and stakes. Ex uh, e exceptions to this policy are the approved student wards located adjacent to a university or college. That's weird. Hmm. In most instances, the established programs for the young adults, young special interests, and special interests in the wards, stake, and region 
when carefully and enthusiastically implemented, meet the social needs of single members of the church without the creation of singles wards. So what they're saying here, now remember, this is 1983, so it's fairly recent. Within the past, I don't know, what, 30 years or something like that. Um, what they're saying here is that they create, like, basically churches designed for the demographic in which they reside, pretty much. They're saying they create um, churches for single people, churches for college students, things like that. Uh, huh. Okay, meetings, general conference, area councils, regional councils, stake meetings, stake council, stake Melchizedek Priesthood Committee. The stake Melchizedek Priesthood Committee consists of the stake president, the chairman, one counselor, vice chairman, and one or more high, uh, I'm sorry, one or more high counselors. The committee meets as needed to help the stake presidency and priesthood executive committee supervise Melchizedek priesthood quorums and to instruct quorum and group leaders. See, there's so much to this church that I just don't know. There's like, it, it's the kind of thing that you have to like, I don't know, join and rise through the ranks to really understand. It's just something that you can't understand otherwise. It's like with Jehovah's Witnesses, I can explain to you guys the terrible things that they do, and you can get it. But it's it's hard to really understand until you've been there yourself, you know. There's like a I don't know, a, a kinship with other ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and even other Mormons. Like, I, I still feel something of a kinship with ex-Mormons um, because they're, they're structured in similar ways. In many ways, they're very similar. And they do a lot of similar stuff. Like, not everybody knows what it's like to go knocking on doors. I remember um, I, had, I had this good friend of mine. He's still my friend. We were Jehovah's Witnesses together growing up, and for some reason, one day, we were <clears throat> about to go in service, and the service overseer, the guy who tells everybody who's going in service with who, who's going to go knock on doors with who, he thought it was a good idea to pair me up with my friend, and we were not like, quote-unquote, spiritually strong in any sense of the term. We were just complete train wrecks. Like, I don't know. He could drive. I don't I don't remember if I could drive at the time or not. I was 16 or 17, maybe. No, I was 15 or 16. And he was, like, a year older than me. And I remember we just drove around this neighborhood for, like, an hour. We didn't even, like, get out at any doors. And we were just talking, and finally he's like, you know, we should probably go knock on a door. So we get out and we go knock on this door. And afterwards we realize like our ties were undone and our shirts were unbuttoned. And we just looked like complete messes, like not paying attention to what was going on. It was just hilarious. Like, I don't know. We were, we were kind of walking away from it a little bit, both of us. Um, and we, we'd lost the thread. We'd lost interest in in the whole religion at a certain point that happens and usually um what happens is when somebody gets to the age of around 17 18 19 20 they start to realize that this shit doesn't make any sense they start to realize that i mean they start connecting dots usually is what happens. Everybody connects dots. They, everybody starts questioning things at some point in their lives. And that's why a lot of religions try to promote their youth programs and they try to <clears throat> rope in the young community and keep them busy and keep them in church and active and all that. Because if you get past the age of 20 or 25 and you're still in religion, you're probably in there to stay. And the reason that most people usually end up staying is because 
of some kind of fear of hell or some or they'll they'll get to see their parent again or some childhood trauma that that you know makes them fear not going to heaven or hell it's the carrot and the stick and i think that that's religion's most powerful um uh, tool against secularism is the carrot and the stick so anyway thought that was pretty interesting um those books I thought were really cool. I mean, just being as old as they are, photocopied and all that stuff. Okay, well, I guess we could probably take some guests now. Let me just check. Um, so it looks like the first person on the list is Satan. Hang on. Let me unmute here. Are you there? Can you hear me, Satan? Testing. One, two, three. Satan, did I unmute you? I did. I unmuted you. What? what? Hey. How's it going? Shit, I didn't think I was supposed to be on here. Oh, it's good. Do you want me to move on to somebody else, or are you down to talk? No, I could. Have yeah. We, have we talked before um, on here? Not really. I've, like, messaged you, like, once. Okay. And that's about it. Okay. I told you to check out the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, which... Right. They're not a cult, but they have cult-like mindsets. They're you're free to come and go. You're but like no shunning or it, any of that. Yeah, they don't do shunning. But what the internet, what I hop in Kansas City does, my family in St. Louis does, like the church does. They follow them like a cult. Really. And when they say they go with it, and it's been a twenty-four hour. Seven days a week, 365 days a year of prayer and worship since September 19th of 99. Wow, that's interesting. Well, here's the thing about it. This is this is how I view it. So <clears throat> you've seen the bite model, I assume, right? Or have you or no? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so yeah. it's a good portion of it. And for a while, I was in a cult for nine months called Mercy Ministries. Mercy Ministries. And it is yeah, it's, um, it's a cult disguised as a counseling facility. I'm uh, I'm actually looking it up right now. So you said Mercy Ministries. Mm -hmm. It's called Mercy Multiplied now, but when oh, I yeah. was there, it was Mercy Ministries. Very interesting. So what was it like? Like, what did they do? What it kind? Was, like, we had a shit ton of teachings by Joyce Meyer. I hate her. Right. Joyce Meyer, I, I don't know of her. I don't think I've heard of her before. In my in the circle I I grew up in basically. Mm. And she has a mansion. She's like one of those mega church people, but it's like a ministry instead. Right. That is very crazy. Well, I'm glad you found your way out. Like how did you find your way out? You said it was kind of What is it? I just left this April. And it was pretty rapid. What I happened? You said it's like a um, it's like a therapy thing, right? Oh, the mercy. Yeah, it's, I've been out for a few years. I just, oh, okay. So, what was the thing you left in April? Christianity. Oh, just general Christianity. Okay. Yeah, I stepped out in April, and I've just very rapid deconversion. That's cool. So I. I wasn't Christian enough, I guess. Right. So I went into the cult because I was going through a lot of shit in my life. A lot of it was caused because I did a six-month missions trip sure. with YWAM in Nigeria, and that fucked me up. Really? I literally wanted to kill myself while I was there, but then everyone was telling me, oh, you're only upset because it's an attack of the enemy, and you're in the God's will if you want to kill yourself. Right. So, yeah. That's very fun. crazy. So uh, what was it ultimately you think? Like what was the straw that broke the camel's back that got you out of Christianity in general? Well, Andrews, the thinking atheist, I started watching a few of his YouTube videos. I discovered you because I had a fascination with cults, started looking them up. That's found awesome. one of your videos, then found Seth Andrews. He's pretty you good. You raised a lot of questions for me. You played a pretty big hand in my leading, actually. That's awesome. I'm so glad um, to hear. 
a fundamentalist Christian until I stumbled upon your YouTube channel. Right. I guess that'll do it. And through Seth Andrews, he started getting me to question things. And when people weren't answering my questions, I somehow found Aaron Ra, and one video later, I was an atheist. Right. Because uh, I'm like, oh, he debunked Noah's Ark. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, what else is a lie now? Yep. I, I figure most of the time, if people make it to my channel and the other channels like that, they're probably like if they're willing to hear out arguments like that, they're probably on their way out anyways. It was I think it was mainly you being so done with Christianity, so done with everything. Do you feel that yeah. way or do you think that it's Yes, I was pretty done. It started out in last July actually, last around this time last year, mm. got into a car accident, really messed up my back, couldn't work. Mm. Then moved in with some friends who were going to help me out. but the, And they were living in an old home. The mortgage got paid off and everything. So all they had to pay was the landlord utilities since sure. there's no mortgage. And then they decided to sell because they lived in a different state and decided having a house in another state was too much of work. Right. So I was like, homeless. And then after that, my car died. And my mom kept telling me, God's trying to get your attention. I'm like, he sounds like a sick bastard that wants me to have Stockholm syndrome. Yep. <laughs> That's funny. Like, yeah. Like a lot of people um, don't realize how messed up the things are that they that they hear. Like, for example, somebody says to you, if you don't get right with Jesus, you're going to go to hell or something like that. Or... Or, you know, something like that. I mean, that's really messed up. That's messed up to hear. And we've heard it all our lives. So we don't consider it to be as crooked and and damaging yeah. as, as it really is, you know. And, and it's just like you said, like, he's a messed up bastard who, who wants you to have Stockholm Syndrome, something like that, right? Yeah. It seems like you were starting to realize, like, just how messed up some of the things were that were being said and done. Yeah, the first time I ever had questions was the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate because I was a young oh, yeah. person. That debate, and I'm like, all Ken Ham was saying, the Bible says so. Yes. That was an awesome well, debate. Ken Ham has support. Yeah. Well, here's my question then to you um, Do you think that we should be engaging Christians, or, or should we just let, let the debate die off? Ah, uh, somewhat. If they're willing, definitely debate them. Some of them are just here to bitch at us right now. Right. So a lot of people said that Bill Nye shouldn't have done the debate. Like, there is no debate. Christianity is just incorrect, objectively, about a lot of stuff. Like, about the Earth being 6,000 years old. Yeah, um, but I was literally deconverted because of that. Right. See, that's that. that would be my position, too, I think. Like, if you're not engaging these people, then, you know, you're, you're never going to bring reason to somebody's world. You're never going to get them to realize that what these people are saying is ridiculous, you know. And it's really sad because there's people like me who were sheltered their entire life. And I didn't really learn. I didn't know anything about evolution until I went to high school. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And you're depriving your children of an education. And then when they start learning the facts, they're like, wait a minute, this makes sense. Yep. I actually didn't learn about evolution until after high school. Um, I never had a single class that taught me evolution. Uh, that may be because my class schedule is messed up or something. I don't have any idea, but that shouldn't happen. Like, that's that's not good, you know? I was, like, 23 before I learned about it, and I taught myself, so. Yeah, I never told my parents we were learning evolution in high school because I was afraid they wouldn't let me learn it. Right. Well, I'm glad you got your, uh, I'm glad you found your way out of that mess because, you know, either way, no matter what good or bad happens in life, I always feel like it's better to know the truth, like, 
the the fact that we don't know we don't have answers and that's okay you know it's okay to not have answers to things as far as i'm concerned but anyway i appreciate you coming on and talking to me and uh maybe i'll get you on another time okay yeah, I can talk more about the cult I was in. Yes, yes, we're going to have to do that. Uh, send me a message in uh, the Ask Telltale channel, okay? All right. All right, bye. Bye. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty crazy about that cult. Uh, Mercy Multiplied. Mercy Multiplied was founded in 1983 by Nancy Alcorn. Nancy Alcorn had previously worked for eight years as an, uh, an athletic director at Tennessee Department of Corrections, huh? Funding, program structure, and content. Yeah, that looks pretty interesting. I may have to, uh, I don't know, read about this a little bit, but anyways, uh, next person on the list is Ghost Aqua. Let me just see if I can unmute. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. You're pretty quiet. Is there any way you can turn your mic up a little bit? Uh, I'm kind of using my phone. Hang on, let me see if I can turn your volume up. S say something again. Uh, hi? That's a little bit better. So, we haven't talked before, have we? No. Uh, what religion were you originally? Are you still religious, or? Uh, I, I used to be an ex I'm a Jehovah Witness, but not anymore. You used to be a Jehovah's Witness, you said? Yeah. Oh, really? So, like, were you born into it? What happened? Uh, I was born into it, pretty much. How, like, w how old were you when you found your way out of it? Is it recent, or? It, it was, like, three, maybe four years ago. Okay. How old are you now? Uh, I'm 16. Okay, good. So, I guess your parents didn't. Like, did they push it down your throat, or what happened? How did they take it when you kind of changed your mind on it? Uh, they, they still don't know. Oh, you broke up a little bit there, but I think I heard you say they still don't know? Yeah. That's a rough situation. Have you considered telling them, or are you just keeping it quiet? I, I think I'm just going to keep it quiet until I graduate. It's a good idea. Sometimes it's best to do that, um, but a lot of people can't. They have a lot of trouble doing that. Uh, just as a side note real quick, I'm sitting here doing the podcast. Sorry to interrupt, but I was sitting here doing the podcast, and all of a sudden I can hear my cat's claws just digging into my carpet and pulling them out. Oh, my God. It's su such a cringy noise. Anyway, sorry. Um, okay. Because I know I have to replace that carpet. <laughs> anyways uh so yeah um that's that's the best decision probably keeping it quiet from your parents but <clears throat> a lot of people have a really hard time doing that it's just not possible for a lot of people so if you can manage to to do that then i'm really happy about that have they kind of been trying to get you to go to meetings or anything like that or have they or do they not really care as much uh I don't know, like, they, they really, they did for try to, like, make, make me, like, uh, I'm good to hold with this. Yeah. But I think it was too much, and, like, mm. ended up getting bored of it at some point. Mm. And, and then I, I got, like, my first tablet, which was, like, the first access to internet that I had. So I started doing research and I slowly started to um, realize. Yeah. Well, so, right. That's it. I'm glad you kind of broke free of the, you know, the, the ridiculous beliefs. I'm glad that you found your way out. Cause like I said earlier, a lot of the time people never find their way out. It's, devastating and it just takes over their lives and makes a huge mess for everybody involved and it's really sad so anyway i am really glad that you you found your way out and uh by the way how did you find your way to my channel out of curiosity uh i well researching things and i kind of saw a video on yours about the 
Sophie, so Sophia and Caleb videos. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, this one's interesting, and yeah. I ended up liking it. So I ended up watching um, other videos. Yeah. From your channel. That's awesome. Those are some older ones. I haven't really done a Caleb and Sophia video in a long time. I think I did one r really recently, but that was the first one in a long time. But anyway, that's awesome. I'm so glad you, you like my videos and all that stuff. But I appreciate you coming on and talking to me. Maybe we'll talk again sometime, okay? Okay. Just a second. Just working on something, guys. Give me one moment. One moment. Dead silence. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses are all over the world. They're like a, an international organization. I'm sure you guys have heard this before. Um, but Jehovah's Witnesses... Um, I actually saw this fairly recently, um, this Wikipedia page. I think it's Jehovah's Witnesses by Country. Yeah, here we go. So we got um, <clears throat> we got Jehovah's Witness by African Country, Angola, Benin. Uh, wow, some of these I can't pronounce, so I'm not even going to try. Chad, Ethiopia, Gabon, Kenya, Niger... Nigeria. Yeah, um they ha they have a presence in every country in the world except for six, I think. It's I don't remember them off the top of my head. I can give some of them. Yemen, um North Korea, uh let's see. Saudi Arabia maybe? I don't remember, but anyways. It you know, it's a lot of like Middle Eastern countries and then it's North Korea pretty much. Uh, and, of course, they're banned in Russia right now, but they still have a presence. They're, as far as I know, they've been banned in China for decades, but they still have a presence. They just have, like, an underground presence. And I heard about this... Um, I heard about this this woman who moved to China at the behest of the Watchtower Society. They requested it of her. She's going to go there and preach, kind of underground on the DL, right? And she didn't really know Chinese super well. She knew it a little bit, enough to get by. So she went there, and she completely disconnected from the brainwashing because, you know, it's banned there, and she was kind of a missionary trying to spread the word and all that good stuff. And having disconnected from the brainwashing like that, after a couple of months, she was out. She realized that it was complete garbage. So I think that, um, I don't know, I, I feel like we could work that in somehow into the solution. If we could just get people to unplug from the brainwashing for a little while, stop going to meetings for a little while, that would probably get a good bit of people out of it. In fact, I, as far as I know, that's how John Cedars, uh, or Lloyd Evans, his YouTube channel is called John Cedars, that's how he found his way out was by kind of unplugging from the brainwashing. Okay, the next person was uh, Small Fry. Let's see. Okay, are you there? Can you hear me? Small Fry. <coughs> Testing, one, two, three. Small Fry. Come in, Small Fry. No? Hello. Hey, how's it going? Hello. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. No I problem. I also turned off my own mic. No hey. problem. So, anyway, uh, hi. what is it? Are you there? Oh, then I turned off my headset. Sorry. Hello. Oh, no problem. So, um, what religion were you originally? Are you still religious, or? Um, I grew in a grew up in a religious household that bounced around from different churches. Okay. Like, we went to like Pentecostal, just blanket different denominations being in one church at the same time, kind of thing. Right. Um, Nazarene. Really? Oh, my, yeah, yeah. My parents were weird. They hopped from church to church. Wow, that's pretty cool, actually. So you got a little bit of experience in everything. Was it a bad experience, though, do you think, or? Um, 
I didn't necessarily care as a kid. Mm. It was more the social interaction because we yeah. lived in the middle of nowhere. Yep. And my sure. parents really didn't let me go outside very often. That's a shame. Um, did, why um, was that? Did that, they? Um, what was that? I guess the story of how I ended up like leaving mm. the idea of Christianity mm-hmm. um, was I would I was going to Awana shortly after starting to see a therapist for mm. my depression and anxiety mm-hmm. at like fourteen, and. Um, other than being told how to behave as a girl, which was not how I wanted to behave, because sure. I think both partners should be equal in the relationship, and if one is wrong and the other one knows that, they should try and point it out. Sure. But a lot of the teachers in Oana's were like, no, a girl has to go with what their husband says. It's the final word. Did, was this like a therapist that was word. telling you this? Huh? Is this a therapist that was telling you this? No, no, no. Oh, this, my God. This okay. was like, yeah, I don't want us. The, oh, the therapist only was like, okay with me going to a us as a means to get social interaction. Oh, uh, right. Since I was incredibly deprived of it. Right. And it was a way we could get my parents to agree to me going outside more. Yeah. I was in the same situation for like a really long time. And, so I know. And along with the telling me how to behave as a woman in a us, um, the other thing I didn't like is they would point out that my happiness was in relation to my relationship with God. And the fact that I couldn't be happy was because I didn't truly believe in God. Okay. So around my junior year, um, I was kind of teetering on the edge. Ugh. And then my older brother, um, I guess, had already just decided he was an atheist. So he started talking to me about it. <laughs> And we started just, like, because we'd grown up having to read the Bible a few times as punishment. Right. Like, back to back. Was that a punishment? They had you read the Bible? Yeah. At times, we would have to read the Bible as punishment or, like, do a Bible study as punishment. And our dad would, like, read our, like, essay on X segment of the Bible or test us to make sure we read it. That's one sure way to make somebody hate the Bible. I know, right? Um, But... (sighs) friend and I would point out all these things that were really hypocritical and I was just like basically by the end of that summer I had basically gone to I sort of believe there's a God but if they are it's certainly not the Christian one right for sure and then by the end of my senior year I was like no I'm I'm full-on don't believe so that's awesome in the summer of that year I ended up telling my dad that I don't believe and he tried to guilt me into staying Christian Okay. By the fact As that he wouldn't see choice, me in right? heaven. Yeah, that, that he wouldn't see me in heaven and yada yada. Okay. And then I had to explain to him he wouldn't care anyway because I'm bi and I can't hope that I like girls too. Yeah. So he just kind of went into a frenzy. Man. So how old are you now? Like how long ago was this? Um, I'm 21 now, so okay. it was a while ago. Okay. Uh, other than that... um. It, it's not been too weird. Right. So how is your relationship with your parents now? Like, has it improved at all or? No. No. They, uh, they, um, kicked my boyfriend and I out of their house and I had to find an apartment when I was 20. Mm, like they happens. wouldn't let me leave until then. Wow, man. Well, yeah, and now they're in New York and I don't really want to talk to them. Right. Well, wow, that's crazy. At least you're you're out on your own now, right? Is what you said. Did I lose you? Are you there? Yeah, I'm, back. I'm oh, back. Okay. I'm, I don't know what that was. Oh, no problem. So you're out on your own now, right? You said. Yeah, I live in a town sort of close to where uh, I grew up, and it's where I work also. Well, good. I mean, so it I sounds like things home. have improved then, right? Yeah, I do pretty good. Good. That's good. And uh, hopefully over time, your relationship with your parents will improve. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, I I lost my mom and she's probably gone for good. It's just something we have to deal with. But we are who we are and we can make our own families and and improve our lives in our own ways. I don't mind because I have my boyfriend and uh, his parents chose their addictions over him. Mm, Yeah. Outright. I understand that, too, actually. So it sounds like you need each other. 
Yeah, we rely on each other a lot. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that things are going pretty well for you. And I appreciate you coming on and talking to me. Maybe we'll talk again sometime, okay? Okay. Hey, uh, Crate, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep. Do you have any questions by chance? I haven't asked you to give me any in a while. I wasn't sure if you're collecting them or not. Yeah, well, uh, not many have come up, so... Okay, that's uh, cool. Yeah, haven't, haven't, uh... Just wondering, all right, in that case, I'm just going to peruse this website. I bet you guys heard me say that earlier in the video. I'm going to peruse this website. Precariously peruse did this. See, uh, did you see that Casey Atheist was in the, uh, No, YouTube I didn't chat? see that. She was? Oh, wait a minute, yep. I gotta say hey to her. Hey! Uh, type that in there. Hey, Casey. Wait, is that the Casey atheist that I think it is? Or is that a different Casey atheist? Well, anyways, hey, Casey atheist. Okay, well, that is, I'm actually going to end it a little bit early. I appreciate you guys coming and uh, listening to me ramble about various things and stuff and such and whatnot. So I will talk to you guys next week.